Welcome back to AM 950 KTNF, the progressive voice of Minnesota. You're tuned into Atheist Talk. I'm your host, Maddie Love, joined in studio by August Berkshire, along with author and professor, Dr. Chester Gorman. August, we cut you off at the last break. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, time is what it is. Um, Chester, we're getting into the area already of social justice, so mm-hmm. I want you to talk about uh, liberation theology and social justice. Well, uh, in my understanding of how all this works, um, the motif, uh, a lot of the motifs surrounding the notion of revelation have direct implications for uh, social justice um, and liberation theology. I take my own work as providing a a sort of philosophical basis or justification for um, liberation theology. If you're not familiar with that, um, it just basically said says that God God is the God of the poor and oppressed. So, my my book provides philosophical justification for that. And as you've heard me speak before, the way I understand Revelation um, and the meaning of Revelation and, and important motifs related to it, such as visibility, invisibility of Christ, transcendence of Christ. Um, Though that the Christ figure specifically refers to persons or a person um, who is systematically precluded um, from having his or her or their own existence um, based on the the culture or set of norms that one is born into. So, again, for example, to draw from sexuality, which psychoanalysis is obsessed obsessed with. Um, the homosexual or the transgender person doesn't really have an existence within um, within that normative framework, um, where you know you're either male or female, and you copulate copulate with the the opposite gender. Um, and so the Christ figure in that context would be could be the homosexual, could be the transgender person, um, or any any variation thereof um, that doesn't fit into you know the standard male female hetero heterosexual framework. So the Christ figure is an oppressed person who reveals to us their existence in a manner of speaking. Yes. Um, so. Those norms, you know, the transgender person doesn't exist from the get-go. You're either male or female. And so the transgender person is systematically uh, precluded, not just oppressed and – or, uh, yeah, not just oppressed but repressed. Uh, they don't have an existence in the beginning. Their existence has to literally be created. And so that revelation is the formation or um, the appearance of that which shouldn't exist. Or that which is not supposed to exist, and that which the particular society, you could say the heteronormative society or the cisgender society, wants to push or make go away. Does this mean I should be afraid of like sitting in caves for three days and pushing rocks away from a tomb? Am I, am I, are you saying that I'm a Christ figure? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, it depends on the representation, right? So the representation according to the normative framework, you're, you're just an aberration. Right? right, the the transgender person is just an aberration, a contingent aberration that shouldn't exist. But sh- the transgender person would insist on their existence, and when they insist on their existence of not fitting, then they become a Christ figure. It's a different representation. It's a representation that goes against the representation of the normative framework. So, in this framework, even using the, the definition that you're using in this framework. An atheist in a lot of places in society would be the Christ figure because a lot of times atheism is just is marginalized. Yeah, absolutely. That's interesting. It could be. It depends on the representation, though, because you can embody your, your oppression, right? You have plenty of, I would say, maybe this is a controversial statement, Republican women who want to live out the norms of patriarchal culture. So they can be women – and they are potential sites of being a Christ figure. But if they embody their impre- oppression, they're just representing patriarchal culture uh, themselves. So they're not really a Christ figure unless they, they challenge that norm and say no. Okay. That's a, yeah. I think that's an important distinction. Yeah, absolutely. So you're saying the uh, character of uh, Jesus in the Bible, whether he existed or, or not, just right. he's a character. Absolutely. Um, made visible the poor and the sick. And yep. so the marginalized. And so it was, it's right to uh, sign the title of Christ, the secular title of Christ 
to him. Mm -hmm. But yet there are modern day, there are other uh, figures, people in the world that reveal things to us. And then we could attribute the title of Christ to them. Yeah. Not reveal things so much. It's not so much teachings. They reveal themselves. They reveal themselves as as in and of themselves sites of oppression where they say, no, this is not me. I exist. I don't exist according to this representation of what you want me to be. So they in and of themselves are Christ figures, despite what they say. Well, what's the difference between a Christ figure and a revelation? Well, it, revelation is just, a, 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 I guess you could say, a formal name for the Christ figure. The Christ figure, him or herself, is revelation. Okay. This is, that sounds still, it's like getting like way over my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, but in I, the Christian terms, we say, we don't, some liberals say, you know, we want the mind of Christ. You know, we want the faith of Christ. And traditional Christianity says, no, the object of faith is Christ himself. Fair. And the same thing for the, the Christ figure today, uh, who you could say resists white supremacy. That person who resists is in and of themselves the Christ figure. And so far as they resist, they reject the cultural de designation according to white supremacy. Okay. Now, uh, <laughs> the title of your new book is called Demythologizing Revelation. Revelation. Uh, what do you hope to be the outcome of publishing this book? Well, I hope it's... Uh, Besides I, making you filthy rich. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's what everybody's made. Uh, I'm on <laughs> like 35 copies sold, so <laughs> filthy rich is probably not going to happen. But, uh, I mean, if anything, uh, you know, my commitment is to Boltman. I'm hoping he's been criticized for not having a, a, a social aspect or a social justice aspect to his theology. So I, I hope my, my work, quote unquote, fixes that. And also fixes his inability, I would say, or the shortcoming in his book to demythologize revelation, but also provide a formal justification for liberation theology, which is where my heart lies. Okay. And make the world a better place. Oh, that's, uh, we appreciate that. We appreciate ultimately that. make the world a better place. Well, I, I can see how this would appeal to theologians. Um, what do you think would be the appeal to atheists? Uh, well, I mean, it gives them justification for their atheism. You know, uh, and in their their encounters with Christians, they can say, well, you know, maybe part of the Christian experience is killing God. Maybe a commitment to Christ, Jesus entails the death of God. And that's something you should seriously consider. That's what I would say. In the words of Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails, God is dead and no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. God okay. persists. <laughs> well, I would, you know, it's, it's one of my favorite songs. Uh, we've only got like 20 seconds left. Do you have any well, final thoughts? Well, my favorite quote by Nietzsche, uh, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. <laughs> of course, you're saying he doesn't remain dead. We have to keep killing him. Unfortunately, yeah. Because our gods apparently keep changing. You know, when I was a Christian, we talked about, you know, this is your God of money is your God. And this, and it sounds kind of like. Yeah, idols. I would say yeah. God in and of God's self is an idol. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in to Atheist Talk. We'd love for you to join us again next Sunday. And remember, if you miss an episode live, you can always catch the podcast. I'm proud to be on the air with Minnesota Atheists, and I hope you've enjoyed the show. The show depends on the generous support of our members, our sponsors, and donors. Please consider supporting the show through the donation link at mnatheist.org. This has been Atheist Talk on AM 950 KTNF, the progressive voice of Minnesota. Minnesota.